think about that in the context of a quality management system. I will give the usual consultant's disclaimer. I am a consultant. Um, the advantage that I have over those of you who are working hands-on in industry is that I see many different quality systems, many different ones. I do a lot of audits on behalf of uh, clients of mine. And of course, I work with different companies in over 30 years. Uh, the two combined probably come to over different, uh, more than 1,000 companies. And each one has some form of a quality management system. And what I try to do is to pull out the best parts and distill them into what I personally consider to be the most efficient, effective quality management system. So the thoughts, but I am a consultant, and consultants always, uh, the first thing they do is say, I'm not responsible for anything. And then they take a lot of money for saying that. So the thoughts, the ideas, and the suggestions are mine. Uh, any regulations, guidances, or SOPs, written instructions and practices of your company must continue to be followed. And you cannot change anything because Karen said, that's not an excuse. You know, my clients, we sometimes have um, some small and uh, occasionally, fortunately, rarely, big disasters where they change things. And afterwards, I say to them, well, what on earth made you do that? And they said, but you said to do it. But I am not working within the system. You have a quality management system. You might call it, in your companies, a pharmaceutical quality system. I'll touch on that shortly as well. Uh, but you have a system and therefore changes must be made in a controlled manner through the company's change control or change management procedure. So let's think about quality. What do you see here? You see here two items. One is a Seawolf Chrono Breitling Avenger watch, which costs $3,000. And on the right hand side, you see India. So the Tata Nano, the city car for $2,500, which is looking here very shiny and nice. And which one would you think was quality? So something for you to think about. In fact, it's very much dependent on the customer, isn't it? Because if the customer has a budget of $2,500 for a car, the only car that meets their requirements is the Tato Nano, and that Nano, and they couldn't have a car without it. So it's quite important that it's available for them. Whereas if someone has a huge budget and is uh, able to spend $3,000 on a watch, they probably would say that the watch is quality, represents quality for them. Neither of those is a particularly good definition of quality, and I'll show you why, because in the meantime, while I'm showing you and explaining, you might want to think how you would define quality. So if we say it meets the customer's requirements, the Tato Nano initially, uh, had several very serious problems, had a tendency to uh, spontaneously combust, go up in flames. So that certainly didn't meet the customer's requirements. Of course, it had to have some fixing uh, until it did. But then think about bananas. So Stewie is my husband. And uh, as you can see, Stewie and Karen, if I send Stewie to buy bananas, which ones do you think he's going to buy? He likes them when they are overripe. And uh, as far as I'm concerned, untouchable, can't eat them. Whereas I like them, when, to buy them green, I'm considerably younger than my husband as well, so I'm optimistic that I'll live out those few days and they will turn yellow and that's exactly how I like them and then they'll be okay. So if we say quality is meeting customer requirements, that's not a very good definition for us. So Philip Crosby, who was the author of Quality is Free, which is um, a fabulous little book, it's available on Amazon. I believe it costs something like $28 um, for the paperback. Well worth reading. Quality is free. He defines quality as meeting uh, the requirements, meeting the requirements. And I, over the years, have refined that somewhat to meeting all the requirements all the time. You can't meet some of the requirements some of the time and say that's quality. And we don't talk about high quality or low quality. We just talk about quality as meeting the requirements. So particularly if we're talking about medication, if we're talking about uh, the manufacture of uh, uh, drug products, they need to meet all the requirements all the time. Um, and then we have to define the requirements. And how do we define requirements? That is probably one of the areas where GMPs, good manufacturing practice regulations, let us down. 
the ones for uh, products because they describe very, very little about planning, about in the quality management system, planning for quality, uh, defining requirements, design requirements. In the medical device regulations, you can find that. Don't find much in the uh, GMPs for finished pharmaceuticals. Now, what do you see here? Here you see a dining room table and some chairs around it. And you see uh, the chairs along the sides have no arms and the ones at the end have arms. Now, I have a granddaughter who's now a teenager, but when she was uh, very young, about three, she came to our house and she was sitting with us at a dinner at the table. And suddenly she says to me rather indignantly, how comes your chair and Zayda, Zayda is what she calls uh, my husband, his grandpa, uh, uh, how come your chair and Zayda's chairs have got arms? So I say to her, well, you know, it's because we sit at the head of the table. Why have your chair and Zayda's chairs got arms? Well, it's because we're the head of the family. Why? Now, this could go on for hours because the answer was not satisfactory. So her, what she actually was saying is, I have a requirement. My requirement is, if you have a chair with arms, I want a chair with arms. And she made that perfectly clear, simply by continuing to refuse to accept my answer because it wasn't good enough. So if you want to define requirements, and it may be requirements for a piece of equipment, for a facility, you keep asking why, but you need to get the answers from subject matter experts, from people who really can define them, because if quality is meeting the requirements, if you miss the requirement, for example, you have a potent drug and you need to manufacture it, maybe not in a dedicated facility, maybe in a shared facility, but with once through air and air extraction, and maybe an isolator or a glove box, you need to define those requirements. The uh, Federal Food and Drug Act of the United States authorizes FDA to establish current good manufacturing practice to avoid adulteration of drugs. Adulteration means it's not quality. It doesn't meet all the requirements. Whatever you wrote in your registration file, you are not meeting either because you are not manufacturing according to current good manufacturing product, uh, practice or because the product is actually deficient in some respect. So not complying current good manufacturing practice means that your drug product under GMP is deficient in some respect. And that is worth remembering. Now, I want to focus for a minute or so, maybe two, on GMP requirements. GMP requirements are not a quality system. They never were a quality system and never were intended to be a quality system, not a pharmaceutical quality system and not a quality management system. They are not complete. They are a set of requirements and therefore they contribute to product quality because you must meet them. If you don't meet them, you won't get your GMP certificate. You won't comply with the all the requirements and you won't be able to market your product. So obviously we have to meet them. The GMP requirements are not a quality management system. They are not rounded off. They don't address or they, they over the years, a lot of elements have been added on as we shall see shortly. But if we think about it going back and I can go back quite a way because I've been in the business for a long time. If we go back to the 1960s, the GMPs, were written for the first time and implemented. And they were good manufacturing practices. In the UK, the orange guide, the infamous orange guide came out. Probably they'll go back to it now what with Brexit and everything. Over the years, it became the EU GMPs because it was adopted pretty much as is, as the EU GMPs. Um, and in parallel, more or less, or maybe overlapping in the US, 21 CFR, the Code of Federal Regulations, uh, parts 210 and 211, for uh, finished pharmaceuticals. Active pharmaceuticals actually had to wait until the year, um, I think it was 2001, when ICHQ7 was is issued, which was actually GMP for active pharmaceutical ingredients, active substances. And until then, 
the FDA had a guidance on drug substance uh, GMPs, but there were no legal requirements. Certainly, it wasn't embedded in the Code of Federal Regulations. Uh, in the 1970s, validation took off. There was the uh, terrible uh, episode in England where um, several people were killed by a contaminated infusion. And it, the main reason turned out was that the autoclave was not functioning on many levels um, as it should have been functioning. One of the elements was validation, that it wasn't the same temperature all through the chamber. And that brought us to validation, which really took off during the 1980s, the 1970s and 1980s. Uh, that's when GMP became known as great mounds of paper, uh, because the validation files had so much paper in them. And then in the 1990s, there was um, the uh, data integrity reared its head for the first time, not as data integrity, but as outer specification results with the Barr court case. And then in 2000, we had Y2K. 2008, there was the heparin scandal. And the heparin scandal, I don't know how many of you are familiar with it, but this was a huge thing. It was contaminated heparin, deliberately contaminated in China, which caused many deaths around the world, uh, over, I believe over 300, and a lot of harm to patients who were on dialysis. It was terrible, and it brought supply chain under the microscope, the regulator's microscope, and inspections uh, became far more rigorous and really started to look into supplier qualification, manufacturer qualification, and everything involved in that. And it, unfortunately, because it originated in China, it took the regulators of China and of course very much to India. And that, um, along with the issues that they found there, brought data integrity to the surface. In between and along the way, ICH um, came out with uh, ICHQ 8, 9 and 10, which were the guidances on pharmaceutical development, risk management, and the pharmaceutical quality system, PQS. And you'll notice that the presentation today is entitled, what makes for an effective quality management system, not a pharmaceutical quality system. The reason for this is that it is my belief that we should not call it a pharmaceutical quality system. We are not different as an industry to any other industry. A quality management system is about effectively managing procedures and processes and handling risks which we identify within the context of our organization. And since our organizations manufacture pharmaceuticals, it will be pharmaceutically oriented. And if we manufacture sterile pharmaceuticals, it will be oriented to sterile manufacturing. But as soon as the quality uh, standard, the quality standard that we adopt talks about the context of your organization, of your firm company, then we have addressed the P from the PQS, from some pharmaceutical quality system. So I do believe, personal opinion, that we should drop the terminology PQS, and we should use the term QMS, quality management system. And I very much, as you will see um, shortly, believe that the one that we should adopt is the ISO 9001 2015 model, which to me is as close, after 30 years of studying the topic, as close as you can get to an ideal system if understood and correctly implemented. So, We'll see where that takes us. Um, anyway, uh, quality by design um, along was in parallel as a fad. I deliberately choose the word fad because I believe that's what it was. I think that if you have a quality management system that's effective, designing quality into your products and, and understanding the uh, product uh, manufacturing process and managing the risks has to be designed into those processes and therefore i never was a big um fan of that terminology but it kind of went along with ichq 8 9 and 10 to which since 11 has been added which is pharmaceutical development and manufacturing for um active substances and of course now we have ichq 12 i'll come to that in a moment 
Around 2015, the European Union uh, finally issued the health-based exposure, exposure limit guidance on uh, risk assessment for shared facilities, which uh, unfortunately I would say 80% of people refer to as the HBEL for dedicated facilities, whereas it was specifically issued with the idea of allowing um, the use of shared facilities with appropriate measures put in place. Um, and then uh, around 2020 until now, the latest uh, regulatory focus seems to be on effectiveness checks. That's what I see at my clients and uh, here when I participate in inspections. Um, have you done an effectiveness stress check for training? Have you done an effectiveness check on your cappers? Have you done an effectiveness check on your changes? So now what I fear is that just like in the 1970s when we saw great mounds of paper around validation, we will see great mounds of paper around effectiveness checks, but we won't necessarily see cappers being handled any better, nor will we necessarily see training being any more effective or leading to better competency, we will just see checkbox exercises because the GMPs are not an overall system. And every time we have an add-on, um, about 80% of the companies, there are always about 20% who do it exactly as it should be done and probably were doing it prior to the requirement. But the large mass don't entirely understand what the regulator's on about wants to please the regulator, know they have to show an effectiveness check, so come up with something that they can show on paper that they did it, just like qualification for training. A person who is qualified because someone watched them and documented that they watched them performing the task still doesn't mean that they can paint bus stop without a drop of paint spilling outside the area where it's supposed to be. The only way to verify competency is to watch them performing that exercise and them to do it correctly. But you could still give them a certificate that they were competent when they weren't. So we do need to think about that. Fortunately, when it comes to competency checks for pilots, airline pilots, I know with COVID, uh, most of us are not doing much travel, but prior to that, I at least was, I believed that competency checks for pilots invariably involved them going on a flight with another pilot more senior to them who observed that they did everything that they were supposed to do and that of course was crucial so these are the issues and as you can see this is from let's say the 1960s till 2020 and it changes it changes regularly where the focus is and then on top of that look at the number of organizations who are either performing inspections, EDQM, the European um, Directorate on the Quality of Medicines, in addition to publishing the European Pharmacopoeia, also performs inspections for active pharmaceutical ingredients. The MHRA in England, the Indian FDA and the US FDA and the China FDA, and the HPRA in Ireland. And of course, um, there are the, the EMA, European Medicine Agency, is above each of the member states. And that's all for the GMPs. Then we have the United States Pharmacopoeia, we have ISO, we have ICH, we have PICS, the pharmaceutical inspection. I don't know about you, but I'm starting to stress. And this invariably happens to me. And not only does it happen to me, I have a client who last year I rashly agreed to do their regulatory intelligence for them. In other words, to prepare a spreadsheet with new regulations that have come out, new guidances, new uh, pharmacopoeal monographs, general chapters, um, PICS guidances, WHO guidances, EMA guidances, and whatever. And I thought to myself, this is a marvelous thing for me to do because I'm a consultant. A, it will keep me up to date. B, um, in addition to doing it for my clients, I can put it on my website and people will be able to buy it. And so it'd be a nice source of income. I did it once. It took me um, several days and 
they wanted it updated every three months. Originally, it was to be every month. And then eventually, we got to every six months. But I just said to them, I can't do it. If I do that, I will do nothing else. Just to stay up to date with the new guidelines and regulations that are coming out, that's what I would have to do. Add to that personal opinion. Personal opinion because each inspector who comes to your facility has an opinion. They have an opinion. They interpret the GMPs in a certain way. And since they are writing up the findings, they will generally be able to tie it in with something that is written in the GMPs or in a guidance somewhere. So they may quote from the WHO, or they may quote from PICS, or they may quote from the ICH, or they may quote from the European Pharmacopoeia or the USP, saying that this is a scientific reference. Or they'll just say this is current industry practice, which is the hardest of all, because what about the context of my organization? It may be relevant for a huge company, Merck, Johnson and Johnson, Amgen, I don't know who, but it's not suitable for my little company, which is, has an effective quality management system and handles that particular risk in a completely different manner. So we are really uh, experiencing a moving target. And that's what you see here, that we're trying to chase our tails in order to keep up with the last inspectional observation. When I was in school, I learned Russian and our Russian teacher taught us a story in Russian. I'll say it in English. There are several reasons for that, but the main one is that I don't remember how to say it in Russian. It was about a grandfather and a grandson taking a donkey to the market to sell the donkey. And as they set out, the grandfather, an elderly man, says to the grandson who is five years old, you ride on the donkey and I'll walk alongside. So they walk alongside for a few steps. And after a few steps, someone stops them. And says, and this is a disgrace. That little boy, he's young, he's full of energy, and he can run alongside the donkey. But the grandfather, he's elderly, he's tired out. He should be on the donkey. They look at each other. And of course, the boy gets down. And the grandfather gets up. They go another few steps and someone stops them. And says, this is a disgrace. That poor little boy, look at his tiny little legs. He can hardly keep up with you. You're a fully grown man. How can you do that? So the grandfather looks at the grandson and he says to him, you know what? You get up here too and we'll both ride on the donkey. So they ride on the donkey a few more steps and someone stops them and says to them, this is the biggest disgrace I've ever seen. That poor donkey can hardly carry the burden of both of you on it. So they both get down and they carry the donkey to market. And I think sometimes that's how our quality management systems look, that we are changing the requirements because Inspector A comes in and says, this is disgraceful, do it this way. And then our next inspection, which may be a customer audit, or it may be a regulator, or it may be a consultant we bring in, they say, this should be done this way. So quickly, quickly, we change it. And then the other one comes in and we end up carrying the donkey to market. And we do not have a robust system. So I think that you can already make a note that in order for a quality management system to be effective, it must be robust. Robust means that we understand why we do what we do and we can justify it. And when a regulator comes in, we can explain to them, we understand sufficiently what their concerns are so that we can say to them, even though you have seen this done differently in a different company, in the context of our organization, this works because now you should just know that many times, many, many times, the reason that an inspection has a bad outcome is not because of the practices, but because of the lack of ability of the person or people who are explaining things to the inspector to clearly and concisely explain what you are doing. So if you see it's going badly during the inspection, stop, don't carry on and say, we understand your concern and we will address it, but don't commit to anything. Let them write down the observation in the report. 
so that it's clear. And then you have time to sit down and think about explaining what you were doing all over again if you really believe it's okay. But we really have to think about making the systems more robust. So we said quality, well, I said quality is meeting all the requirements all the time. How do we determine the requirements? We ask a lot of questions. The only way to determine requirements is to ask questions. Um, as a consultant, I find myself doing it almost endlessly because customers say to me, we want to plan a new facility which is going to be used for packaging potent drugs. And I say, well, how many potent drugs? And I start asking them all sorts of questions about the processes that are going to go on in there. Is it going to be powder? Is it going to be liquid? If it's liquid, the concerns immediately are much smaller. If it's powder, are you going to contain it? How are you going to contain it? Are you going to have an air handling system with over pressure or under pressure? And so on and so forth to define the user requirement specifications. But the answers must come from subject matter experts, not from somebody who says, oh, don't worry about that, it'll be all right. Or somebody who gives you an answer, but the answer is not verified, it's not reliable. It must be people who are expert in the particular requirements we are trying to define. And if we are constantly adapting our QMS, quality management system, to meet the perceived demands of the last inspector who visits, the system will not be effective. And the reason I say perceived is because we do not always fully understand what they are saying. We want to get our GMP certificate renewed, and therefore we agree to what we think they want. Sometimes it isn't even what they wanted. So something to think about there. I have a fundamental quality and QMS question for you. And I would like you to think about it uh, for a very short time before I move on to the next slide. If you wish, you can write your answers in the chat. Uh, does, can, any deviation which occurs meet requirements? In other words, if I manufacture a batch and that batch has a deviation associated with it, directly associated with the manufacturing process or associated with the facility, with an operator, with a material that's going into the batch, can we really say genuinely that that batch is a quality batch meeting all the requirements all the time? Answer, I think is fairly obvious, no. We cannot say that, which does not mean that we won't have any more deviations. But I would like to show you um, a short thread that went on in LinkedIn over the last few weeks, which was, I don't know how many of you follow Jan Kugel. I would st strongly recommend that you do. He uh, gives lovely GMP tips and definitions and all sorts of things, and is a very wise uh, man. So, but he asked the, uh, a polling question, uh, what drives batch release decisions in your organization? And he wrote, it should be an easy decision, but is it? And 15% of those asked, 9% said politics, 7% said KPIs, key performance indicators, 85% said quality. So that sounds lovely, doesn't it? 85% said meeting all the requirements all the time. That's what quality is, no? So 15% said the quality is not the main driver for batch release at their company. If you're part of the 85% who said quality, what advice would you give them to help them change the quality culture at their company? But I raised another point. I asked the question, what if the 15% answered honestly? What if it's true? politics, in other words, company culture, or key performance indicators like getting the stuff out are what drive batch release decisions. And the 85% who said quality were not lying, but just because they really did believe it, but not strictly adhering to the truth. Why? Because if you're going to really look into quality culture, you have to think about 
preventing bad things from happening and not quality, as you see in speech marks, driving batch release, either the batch meets requirements, all of them, and can be released or not. And if it doesn't, presumably it should be rejected. How many of the 85% who answered that quality drives batch release accept that? And how many release batches with, and again, speech marks, justified, no impact on quality deviations? So I'm not saying that there is a perfect quality management system where deviations will never happen. Mistakes will happen. But if you see what Stefano Talami wrote, who is the chief operating officer at PM Pharmaceutici in, uh, I believe it's in Spain, mistakes will happen. It's inevitable. What happens after differentiates average organizations from great ones. Don't blame and fix. Don't carry your mistakes around with you. Use them as stepping stones. So uh, my thought was you can make any mistake once, but if your quality culture is prevent then when something happens you must learn you must fix and you should never see similar incidents in the future then you come out stronger and you have a robust qms so you ask why not who and blame there should be a comma here very poor punctuation and then address the why that's how i believe it should happen so um, I must share with you uh, a eureka moment. What's a eureka moment? It's when suddenly you see the light. Um, mistakes will happen, possibly, but should we start out accepting that? In other words, when we're setting up and maintaining a quality management system, should we accept as a given that mistakes must happen? No, we shouldn't. Our goal, our performance standard should be zero defects. That doesn't mean we will achieve it. So I came up with this kill kappa when my husband, who's a trombone player, was in the Israel Philom Philharmonic until he retired under the baton of Maestro Zubin Mehta. So there's some Indian input for you. Uh, he gave me a eureka moment when he was looking over my shoulder at a lecture I was preparing. And he said, and he saw that I was talking about quality meeting all the requirements all the time. And he said he played in a band and the conductor could not, literally could not understand how a musician could play a wrong note. He would ask in total frustration, but if you're not going to play the right note, how do you know which wrong note to play? Now I know you're hearing that and you're saying to yourself, but it's easy to play the wrong note. In other words, it's easy to create a deviation, but it isn't easy to avoid and prevent deviations. This is true. However, the quality system, the whole purpose of the quality management system is to prevent bad things from happening, to control and manage identified risks. Therefore, the preventive action of kappa, where kappa is responding to deviations, is redundant. If we adopt a genuine risk-based thinking, which is what you'll find in ISO 9001 2015, and we implement robust corrective actions to fix the QMS when it fails and yields a deviation, then we will succeed in reducing the overall number of deviations. And if you think to yourself, well, how do they know which wrong material to add to the batch? It sounds odd because obviously they take the one that was there to hand, but the concept of that conductor who, if you're a musician, how can you play a wrong note? So if you are working in a robust quality management system, how can something go wrong? Which doesn't mean it won't, but the performance standard, the goal is zero defects. That's um, a thought anyway. 
And then uh, someone objected to that uh, for the same reasons as you would. And I, to that I replied that to me, the Eureka moment was the fact that this conductor couldn't even comprehend how they could do it. It's a fantastic and correct approach to do it right first time, which is in Phil, Philip Crosby's book, Quality is Free. Our industry, the pharmaceutical industry, GMPs accept deviations as a fact of life. And unfortunately, most of our quality resources are spent on deciding, and you'll notice this in speak, speech marks, there is no product impact. This deviation happened. There was a microbial deviation when we were manufacturing sterile product, but it doesn't affect our product. The process went wrong. The weights were wrong. The machines broke down, but it's got no impact on our product, which is a logical impossibility if the process went wrong, unless the process was wrong to start with. So again, it's food for thought. What is then a quality management system? Think about entropy, think about chaos. Entropy says there's a natural uh, tendency to disorder. And how many of us have never felt in our lives, stop the wheel, I want to get off like this poor lab mouse? Most of us, because the chaos sometimes overtakes. So you never come home to find your house more tidy than you left it in the morning, unless someone invested energy, entropy, in tidying it up. And that rarely happens. A quality management system, you can quickly write down your definition, but a quality management system is process based. It is the sum total of the organized energy invested to create order, arrangements made with the intention of ensuring what? That all the requirements have been defined and are met all the time. And what's the purpose of a quality management system? The purpose is to prevent bad things, to prevent unintended consequences from happening while getting products or services out to the patient, to the user. A QMS is useless if it only stops things from happening. It needs to facilitate change and stimulate controlled improvement. But it needs to do so while preventing deviations. If we look at ISO 9001 2015, which is this International Standards Organization Quality Management Standard, it tells us one of the key purposes of a QMS is to act as a preventive tool. Consequently, ISO 9001-2015 does not have a separate clause on preventive action. It doesn't need it. Corrective action, yes, because you can put in place the most effective QMS there is, and still something will come from out left and blindside you, and there will be an incident, and you will handle it, but you won't handle it from the perspective of what do I do to push my product out the door, but more from the perspective of how do I make sure this situation which occurred never recurs, never happens again. And therefore, since the key purpose of the system is to act as a preventive tool, we don't need preventive actions. We have only corrective actions when we fail, when the system fails and we get a deviation. The concept of preventive action in this quality system uh, management system uh, standard is expressed through the use of risk-based thinking in formulating the quality management system requirements. So now we find ourselves in a dilemma because the GMPs are not 
they, they are risk-based. The requirements in GMPs were written primarily to overcome incidents that occurred. They were preventive actions, but they were a bit haphazard. And over the years, the guidances have been added on. I call it always the effect of the traffic light at the intersection. Because when does traffic light go up? A traffic light is very expensive to install, something like a million dollars at an intersection. And unfortunately, it only goes up after there have been tragedies and after people have been injured, usually after people have been killed. Nowadays, they tend to put in traffic circles or roundabouts. In any case, the concept of preventive action should be expressed through using risk assessment at the time that we are developing user requirement specifications, URSs. Design, process design, facility design, cleaning design, that's where we should be using it. If we use it correctly, we can stop the bad things from happening. And uh, the guide itself tells us that the, the ISO standard employs the process approach, which incorporates the PDCA cycle, plan, do, check, act, and risk-based thinking, which enables an organization to plan its processes and their interaction. To me, the guide itself has in it every element a company could need to set up and maintain an effective quality management system, which will then be GMP compliant because in the context of your organization, you will take the GMP requirements and integrate them into planning and designing the processes. And it enables an organization to ensure its processes are adequately resourced and managed and opportunities for improvement are determined and acted on. So I'm not going to sit here and read through the standard. You can purchase it and read it. I will talk briefly about the PDCA cycle, which is completely absent from GMP. This cycle is, to me, so logical. It is the continuous improvement cycle, and it incorporates leadership in the middle, it incorporates customer requirements, including regulators, the organization and its context. What are we manufacturing? Are we a cell therapy manufacturer? Then we have those special regulations and highly manual processes. Do we produce tablets? We have powders to deal with. That gives us our context. It's pharmaceutical, so we don't need to call it a pharmaceutical quality system. It's a quality management system where the organization is a pharmaceutical organization and that is part of the context. And then the needs and expectations of relevant interested parties. That would be GMPs, regulators, because there are many GMP expectations which we will need to meet. So we incorporate it into the QMS and then we have a robust system and we ensure customer satisfaction because the outcome of the quality management system is products and or services and customer satisfaction. And we get feedback because we have evaluation. And so we are checking and if necessary, we will improve, we will act and we'll go back to planning again. So a very simple cycle, but something really important. And again, on LinkedIn, what I find is because I'm involved in uh, you know, uh, groups related to quality, so very often things come up which just uh, highlight them. So Ron, Veronica Stevens, Senior Vice President of Quality and Risk Management. Uh, I don't, don't know which company. Again, you can go in and look. But she mentions Deming Prize winner and past MIT professor, uh, Shoji Shiba's book, A New American TQM, which is a classic. So again, I think that Philip Crosby's book does it, but honestly, the ISO standard is every bit as good. But what she does say is before you start thinking of any other quality improvement tool, do this. 
And then she's got another cycle on it, SDCA. To me, PDCA covers the lot, but you are free to look at it and investigate it. What I did say was that she mentioned very clearly, focus on the vital few, which was something that I had forgotten. So I was very happy that she reminded this. Management strategy, focus on the vital few. We have so many, how many cappers do you have open in your company? You just think about that. How many are open and why? Because an inspector came in and gave her an other, a minor, audit and uh, uh, finding, inspection finding, and now we have to write a response, and now we have to deal with it, and we have so many, and we have so little time, and so we never get round to it. And they are not the vital few. They are the less important many. So if you want a robust system, we are going to have to go back to focusing on the vital View. If you get a major observation in a regulatory inspection, that is vital. It is definitely vital. And I'm not advising you to ignore all the others. I'm saying you've got to make your system more robust with the minor ones. Try and avoid having to adopt them. In the context of our organization, why is this not important? You know, you may get an observation that the calibration sticker was out of date. So the calibration sticker was out of date, but we have a computerized validated system which sends an alarm to the head of maintenance when calibration is needed. What should we do with that observation? Take off the stickers. Don't put them on the equipment. Then the next time you'll get an observation that the operator doesn't know if the equipment is calibrated or not. So have an electronic system of notification or a barcode that they can scan with their phone to see if it's calibrated or not calibrated in the date of the next calibration. And then you don't have to manage stickers. We need to be smart and we need to use smart devices and we need to think pharma 4.0 and moving to digitize, digitization. We cannot, we have limited resources. We must use them wisely. Okay, it's to invest energy to overcome the natural tendency to disorder the chaos of entropy. And unwavering, I think wavering there is spelled actually incorrectly, and I'm going to correct it so that you have it correct. Of course, uh, that has taken me back to square one, like in snakes and ladders, oh dear. But if you'll just bear with me, I will get back there. Here we are, unwavering. It's not a waiver, wavers, W-A-I-V-E-R, are when you decide that you're not going to the planned deviation, which is not quality. It means we have a requirement and we're going to allow ourselves not to work according to it. And unwavering means I don't drift from it, commitment to do it right the first time. What's in it for me? This is something, a message that you need to take back to your organizations, upwards and downwards. In other words, all the way to the CEO and the board of directors and down to the last employee. They have to, you have to think process and whatever they are doing, it will be easier, happier, and more efficient if the process is correctly set up, planned, if they can do it without deviations happening, if when you check it works as planned, or if it doesn't work as planned, you go and act and replan it, redesign it so that it does work. Deviations represent uncertainty, risk and variability, and are related to the probability of process failure. Sooner or later, it will fail. Understanding, reducing and controlling variation over the life cycle of a product process or service truly reduces quality costs. And I'll come back uh, very shortly because time is running on to quality costs. ICHQ10 was issued in 2008. In 2008, the current ISO standard, which was issued then, was ISO 2008. 
as in 1001-2008, which had CAPA in it. Therefore, it's logical that when ICHQ-10 was written as an add-on patch to the GMPs, it should mention CAPA as one of the four foundational parts of a quality management system. ISO 2000 and 9001-2015 uh, was updated and removed the concept of CAPA. But we still have in our industry ICHQ-10 as this PQS. So I would strongly advise you to adopt the ISO standard. It has the elements of ICHQ-10. Knowledge management and enablers I'll talk about right now, but you'll notice that it does say this document establishes a new guideline describing a model for an effective quality management system for the pharmaceutical industry, referred to as PQS. But there's no reason that we should have a special one. The objectives are to achieve product realization, establish and maintain a state of control, and facilitate continual improvement. Absolutely, absolutely. But in every uh, way that does not or in no way does that contradict the objectives of ISO 9001 2015 quality management system, which says that one of the key objectives is prevention. So we will achieve product realization, get it out without drug shortages, when our processes are robust, when we've established and maintained a state of control, and if we allow continual improvement so that our facilities don't age, so that our processes don't age and they continue to work, and we improve the processes as we gain more knowledge. ICHQ-10 added to local GMPs, enablers. Enablers are tools. And the tools supposedly were knowledge management and quality risk management. And it talked about four foundational pillars of an effective quality management system, which were process performance and product quality monitoring system, CAPA, change management system, and management review of process performance and product quality. So these were add-ons which subsequently were integrated into the European GMPs chapter one, which are adopted in India as well, and have become part of the GMPs, but they were added on. And when you add on something, the companies already had quality systems. They were quality systems which were based on GMPs. And then we have to ask ourselves, do regulatory expectations enable or block an effective quality management system? Do we need ICHQ-10 and are we obligated to follow it? I, and this is my personal opinion, would say that we certainly are not obligated to follow it. It says in the guidance itself that it is voluntary. The elements which appear in the GMPs must be in our systems, but if we are following ISO 9001-2015, they will be in there. I just very quickly, it will take a minute to show you all of them, and I'm just going to flash them up, and you will have the presentation afterwards. You can go back and look at them. But this is since 2019. Guidances, aid memoirs, recommendations that the Pharmaceutical Inspection Cooperation Scheme, Convention uh, Scheme, uh, has issued since 2019. So an aid memoir on packaging, an aid memoir on assessment of quality risk management, a draft PICS recommendation on how to evaluate slash demonstrate the effectiveness of a pharmaceutical quality system in relation to risk-based change management. My blood pressure rises just reading the title. Uh, good practices for data management and integrity in regulated GMP GDP environments. This alone is a quality systems guidance, not a quality management system, but a pharmaceutical quality system guidance. And then the EUs themselves, the GMPs, the part three and part four. There is ICH, including. Q12 life cycle management, which is fairly new, continuous manufacturing, um, analytical procedure development. So there are some new ones on the way. Important documents. I won't say that they are of no value, they are of high value. 
but how are we going to make our system robust if we need to integrate all these overlapping repetitive guidances? And then came data integrity and look what a mess. Look at it. It started out in England with the Medicines Healthcare Regulatory Agency, and then they updated the guidance. They had a GMP one, and then they made it a GXP one to cover other areas like clinical data. And FDA data integrity, which is questions and answers. The WHO World Health Organization on good data management practice, which then they put out a guidance on data integrity in 2020. Both of these are quality systems guidances. They're not just question and answers, they're 50 page documents. PIX, where's PIX? PIX also, 50 pages. MHRA in 2018, EMA in 2016, and APIC for uh, drug substances, for APIs, also a pharmaceutical quality system guidance. So how are we going to, with limited resources, understand the content and integrate them into our procedures and into our culture and into our quality management system. Impossible. I posit that it is impossible and we shouldn't try. What we should do is have a very robust quality management system. An enabler is a personal thing that makes something possible. But equally, it can be a person who encourages or enables negative or self-destructive behavior in another. Let us make the enabler to our QMS make the system possible. It needs to be robust. We need data integrity. We don't need eight different guides. Pharma 4. Pharma 4 is about digitization, automation, validate design, robust systems, put in place the necessary controls, lock them, validate them, automated data trails, audit trails, automated sign on, sign off, preferably biometric from a smart device. You will resolve your data integrity issues. It's counterintuitive because we tend to believe or have done for too many years, myself included, that if it's paper, it's safe, and if it's um, computerized, it's dangerous. The reverse is true. There's too much guidance. We cannot keep reinventing the wheel. ISO 9001, one of the key purposes of a quality management system, to act as a preventive tool. Plan, do, check, act. If you go to 9001 2015, the ta table of contents, you have the context of the organization, you have leadership, leadership and commitment, customer focus, quality policy, integrity is within that and data integrity is within that. Planning, resources, risks and opportunities and quality objectives, planning of changes, it's all there. It's honestly competence, competence and awareness and communication. It's all in there. Whereas here we have ICHQ 10 with P uh, pharmaceutical quality system elements and then a revised Annex 1 on sterile products with a separate chapter three on a quality system. It's impossible, it's not robust. So now in the last few minutes, I will share with you my maybe futuristic, but it isn't futuristic because Elon Musk who in 2019, we were told, was uh, Tesla was about to go broke, fold up, bankrupt. Eight industries have been disrupted by Elon Musk and his companies. SpaceX has made NASA, NASA, the National Space Program of the United States, irrelevant. He has plans to colonize Mars and thinks artificial intelligence, the Tesla, is around I live in Israel. They've just come to Israel in the first month. They sold, I can't remember the numbers. I suspect it was something like 200,000, which is crazy, bearing in mind the size of the company. It was an incredible number. Um, 
uh, so the Tesla, you know, it's a, it's a, it's around, and that's it. But we in our industry are ultra conservative, and we have barriers to pharma 4.0, to digitization, to using a smart device. Imagine coming to the facility in the morning, you pick up a smart device. It's a tablet. It's an iPad. It's biometric it reads your finger or face recognition unique to you you can no longer pass your friend's magnetic card when they are coming an hour late and falsely declare that they were there that is an opportunistic crime where the opportunity is removed by switching to pharma 4 you have a smart device that device is loaded up with training programs like the Khan Academy. The Khan Academy, if you look online, you'll see what it is. My husband, when he retired, decided he wanted to study algebra. He hadn't done it since school and he thought it'd be good for his mind. And he signed up for a Khan Academy, of course. They test you, your knowledge, by pushing you questions. It's not a question of did you get the question right or wrong. It's how long did it take you until you answered. If you took too long, they push you cues training retraining and then they push you a replacement question and you don't pass the test until you're competent until they can tell by your reaction time based on an algorithm which analyzes other participants reaction times that you understand the concept competency so simple so straightforward for years it's been bothering me that companies just write down 80% pass for GMP test. What about the 20% that the person does not understand and got wrong? It's a black hole. So my plan, but again, this is a personal vision. It has to be the vision in your company before you can adopt it has to go through change control and you have to get senior management on board. Adopt ISO 9001 2015 as is. Remodel whatever quality system you have, PQS, quality system, QMS, to be ISO 9001 2015 compliant, understanding the concepts there and implementing them as intended, not just ticking boxes. Drop ICHQ 10. Whatever is in there will be covered under ISO 9001 2015. And adopt Pharma 4.0, lowering the, lowering the barrier for computerized systems, where data algorithms are going to push you information, like Amazon, like Facebook. If I go onto Google and I book myself a ticket to London, which unfortunately I've been doing fairly uh, regularly recently, my father's unwell and he still lives there, um within two seconds i get pushed coupons for hotels i get pushed coupons for booking.com for theaters in london how because there is an algorithm which is constantly trawling the data and how do we do annual product reviews we go manually to batch records which are barely legible written filled in by hand and we pull the data out with forceps is so inefficient and then we have disasters i don't know how many of you are aware of this but there was a subcontractor in baltimore who ruined 50 actually i think it was more in the end 60 million doses of johnson and johnson vaccine because they mixed up the starter vaccine from astrazeneca with johnson and johnson so for all our pharmaceutical quality system Disasters are still happening and haste makes waste. And top universities have data integrity issues. And if you think you're honest, then read Dan Ariely's book, The Honest Truth About Dishonesty, where he tells about a kid who goes, comes home from school, tells his dad he's got a detention. He says, why? And he says, I nicked the pen. I stole the pen from the boy who sits next to me. And uh, he says, you idiot. What do you do that for? There's hundreds of pens at home. I bring them home from work every day. So integrity cannot be individual standards. What is data anyway? Data needs to be analyzed to obtain information and applied back to the process as useful knowledge 
to refine the process. Plan, do, check, act. If we don't have accurate information and if we don't analyze it effectively, we don't gain knowledge and we can't improve our processes. And of course, data governance and integrity are crucial. Don't misunderstand me there. Deming, that famous, famous quality person, said we've learned to live in a world of mistakes and effective products and services. I added that as if they were necessary to life. If I had to reduce my message to management to just a few words, I'd say it's all about reducing variation. And I'll finish up, although there are a few more slides, but I'll skip through very fast because our time is running out. Uncertainty is risk. I go on the internet and this is the recipe and the picture. And this is what comes out when I bake it. Why? Because I'm not managing that variation. I taught uh, university students and I had them bake a chocolate cake where I gave them the recipe downloaded from the internet and I read it out verbally. And this is what we got. I met Moran who made this cake, which, dec which decorated, she made it because it was her boyfriend's birthday and the other students told her off. They said, you weren't told to decorate it. But you see, they weren't told what size baking tray to use. And one of them did sublots. He was a boy and he didn't want to give it to the girls without tasting it first. So he did an organoleptic test. Uncertainty, risk and variation. And from there, we get to here where the students themselves did a risk assessment. They looked at the critical process parameters to get low risk, low variation and process control. And they did that by controlling the inputs so that the output was less variable. Training and qualification, education and competency. We constantly, the CEO of Roche Pharmaceuticals, we constantly underestimate the ability of people to transform themselves and thrive in new roles. The more people move around, contribute in different areas, work with different people, teams are on different topics, the greater the enrichment across the network. And this is what he had put up, which I felt was so to the point. Tips for talent flow could even be life throw. Create the space to flow. They say ruthlessly, I would don't like the word ruthlessly, I would say strictly prioritize to create space for the most impactful work. The critical few, the vital few, know your personal purpose, play to your strengths and passions. Bring it back to the mission, be clear on a common goal, QMS, and how you and your colleagues contribute to it and focus on adding value. Be blind to the boundaries of departments, job descriptions, or roles. Think bigger, but within the confines of your own job description, because you have to have the authority for what you're going to do. You can't exceed that. Quality is not costly. I won't go into this model. It's not my model. It's stolen from somewhere. I'm not sure where. Whoever did it is a genius. It's the iceberg model. What you see, the direct traditional cost, as opposed to what's hidden when you do things wrong and you lose profit and you have lower sustainability. And the next slide you'll see is taken from Philip Crosby's book. It's the cost of non-quality. Uh, the cost of quality is percentage of sale, sales and um, very, very costly. If you're not calculating the costs of quality, you are actually wasting about 20%. And when you get to certainty in your QMS, when you have a really mature system, your reported will be 2.5%. That's the people you have in your quality department and the activities they're doing, and the actual will be 2.5%. So you'll be saving 17.5% on what you're selling, which is a huge amount of money, which companies are currently losing day in and day out. So to think about when you go away, do you think your company has an effective QMS? Do you call it a pharmaceutical quality system? And if you do, why? That's just something to think about. It's all about context. And what's in it for me? Whoever I am, whatever I'm doing, whatever process I'm involved in, reduce variability, reduce waste, shorten timelines, help the patient and make a profit. And to quote Philip Crosby, quality should be first amongst equal. It's not more important than timelines, and it's not more important than cost.
but it's equal to it because you need to meet all the requirements all the time. And with that, thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Thank I'll you. I'll put my for... webcam back on and we can do <laughs> questions. It was really, a, we can see your experience of so many years in the passion, the way you have delivered this talk and the way you have constructed this. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. Do we have questions? Yes, yes. Okay. So do you want okay. to read them out? Can I see them? Uh, yeah, if you know, if I have to, you know, if you want to see, I'll have to make you the organizer, or I can oh, read it oh, out you to can you. Just re you can just read them out. That's fine. Yeah. yeah. So your webcam is still not on, Karen. Oh, you can it was. Hang on. No one can see you. Share your webcam. People can yeah, see you. Great. Great. Okay. You've got several compliments. Excellent presentation. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and it really shows your experience of 30 years. Uh, and the, with the the passion with which you have delivered and the new concepts which uh, uh, not really new but uh, focusing on ISO that's that's really great. Okay, so here's uh, one question. I'll read it out. Uh, to establish effective quality systems requires right quality culture and quality mindset, uh, which is very important. Uh, you know, you, since you have so much experience, would you suggest any you know your experience any thoughts how people do this of building quality culture and mindset of course everybody says it has to stop it has to start at the top but you know really on the ground how how does it happen okay so again building on the 30 years it's complicated because at the end of the day if at the very top you have somebody a person, a CEO, or a president of a company, or even an owner of a company, who really doesn't have that mindset, it's very, very difficult to change it. And I can tell you that in my in the course of my career, which has spanned over 30 years, and I have worked with a lot of different organizations, um, there were two that I walked away from, literally fired the client. And in each case, it was because, as I saw it, I stood no chance of changing or impacting the culture, because at the very top, there was such resistance. And one was a company that I worked with for about 14 or 15 months, where the CEO was on board, but the president was not, and ultimately, the CEO left. So... You know, I, I'm sorry to depress some people with that uh, being said, but that is rare. That is exceedingly rare. If you are in a company like that and you really reach that conclusion, you need to walk away. You need to go and find a different company where you can have an impact. In any other organization, it should be possible to educate up. You can also achieve a huge amount by educating your peers. And I was privileged very recently in fact i will mention the company normally i wouldn't but the company um placed it um um something about their quality week on linkedin and i was so happy connection was lost but i see now it's restored so i'll carry on i was so happy with what the uh, company put there because i went there to give a lecture on quality to the senior management, uh, just a one hour lecture was supposed to be very, it was very, very concentrated. You got some bits of it integrated today. Um, but I was very concerned. I don't like quality weeks because quality days and quality weeks tend to suggest to me that the rest of the year quality is not important. However, this company, um, Actually, Neuroderm, I, uh, Neuroderm, and they are part of, oh gosh, what's the company? A huge Japanese company. Gone out of my head. Gone out of my head. Okay, well, anyway, they uh, stressed that we are this week reminding you how important quality is to all of us, but don't think that quality isn't in our minds every day. And I really, I loved that. So there's a lot of educating we can do to our peers, the people who are equal with us in the organization, 
some of them will probably have impact going up, even on people you know, who are quite resistant. And of course, we can always educate down. The best way to change culture is by personal example. If you want people to adopt um, a behavior, you have to do it. There was a time when uh, I had employees working for me as a consultant and I had an office and a secretary. And one of the employees came to work in the office in flip flops, you know, uh, open back sandals. And I actually got worried about this from an employer's perspective that if she tripped or something, I would have liability uh, under, uh, you know, as an employer. And I didn't like it anyway. I felt that if clients came to the office, they would see her dressed like this and it just wasn't really suitable. So I said that I wanted to make a policy that in the office, none of us wore open back shoes. We all wore sandals as a minimum. And she wasn't very pleased about it, but she did do it. And so did my secretary. My secretary anyway always came in sandals and so did I. But one day on a Friday, which is not a work day in Israel, I wanted to go to the office for personal reasons, wasn't even anything to do with the office. Um, and I was wearing open back shoes. And obviously no one's going to see me and no one will ever know, but I changed. I changed into sandals. I felt that somehow that act made me a reasonable boss. If I demanded it of my employees, and if she had she gone in on a Friday, I would have wanted her to wear sandals, then the same applies to me. So the best thing is to set a personal example. That answer the question? Have I lost you? Okay, I'm on mute, sorry. Uh, oh, right. so, <laughs> okay. You're getting several several compliments for an excellent presentation. Okay, so here I'll pick up one more question, which is again related. We just spoke about quality culture and how do you change that? Uh, this is a question about traditional mindset. And you know, like when you're going at new thing, Pharma 4.0, digitalization and the new technology, how you know how easy or how difficult you have found doing this in your uh, uh, in your experience, and how you know how have you seen what is the best way to influence uh, uh, management? Uh, I mean, it could be your peers, it could be people down below you or people above you to change, you know, change the mindset, right. change the tra traditional mindset. It, it's quite difficult, as you well know, I'm sure all of you, to change a traditional mindset. However, I think that in India, there is a lot of openness to digital, to digital and new technologies. I think the place to start is in your human resources department. You have to persuade them to hire younger people. I know that's ageist, and it's ageist against myself because I'm quite old. So, but nevertheless, you know, these breakthroughs, they don't come from people of my generation. They come from geeks. And we have to look for those geeks and we have to get them into our organizations and they have to be able to influence. So take on student interns and then do costings. Do costings because that's what talks. If you come to management, senior management, money talks. You need a dollar sign or a rupee sign in front of it. And then they will listen. And the savings, the return on investment for digitization is so massive that companies, this is my belief, it's a personal belief, but I have also seen statistics from McKinsey to support it. The companies that do not adopt digitization within the next five, possibly 10 years, I believe now five, because I started talking about this about five years ago, uh, they will be left behind and they will be wiped out. They will not be able to compete from a price perspective. And it's not about, you know, there were always the Luddites who didn't want progress. It's not about eliminating headcount. Uh, probably we will see um, some kind of a drop. It's about realigning resources because you still need people to program uh, computers and to manage computers and to make sure that they don't fail and so on. But I, I think the way to change mindset is 
via human resources department, via education, of course, and by um, showing the costs, the cost savings. Thank you, know, you manual, absolutely. Yeah, manual uh, product quality review as opposed to pressing a button and it yes. being done for you. Yes. And that is realistic. It is realistic. Right. Okay. So here's a little longish question first. Uh, they ha she has given her opinion and then I think it's a question, but let me read it out. It's an interesting one. Yep. Uh, QMS to me is defined by the quality department with the inputs from all departments. Where do you start when you want to make, make the change to improve sites QMS when the senior leadership, most of them look only at output and sugarcoat the need for QMS? I think this you would have heard this many times in your career of 30 years, this comment. <laughs> I've heard it and uh, the companies and senior management see the quality department as an overhead. And unfortunately, there are still many companies where they see the QMS as belonging to the quality department. Neither of those is true. The QMS belongs to everybody or is everybody's business. I don't like the idea that it belongs to everybody because then it has no owner. So yes. the owner is the most senior official of the company. But if that's it, if we go back to here, this is what convinced senior management. And I can tell you that that organization that I mentioned, who in the end I fired, we got as far as here. We got as far as awakening before I decided that it wasn't going to go any further. So, and that was, you know, that was considerable progress. And they calculated the cost of quality and the failures that they'd had. And they came up without seeing this with 3%. And I said to them, look at the table, your actual is 18%. And then they looked at how much money that was and that convinced them to carry on. But ultimately in that organization, the uh, most senior person, the president, wasn't willing to continue with it and was at a uh, war with the uh, CEO. And so it didn't carry on, but logically it should have done. Thank you, absolutely. Okay, so there are several questions. We'll take one last, we are coming to end of our time. Uh, we'll take this last question. Uh, this is about a startup company, a small company. You did mention mm -hmm. that in the beginning. So the question is, you know, how do you implement this quality management system in a startup company? Because this person's experience is that, you know, in a startup company, managements don't accept what quality experts are saying. Um, Again, it's not the same thing. <laughs> if you look here, it's off the slide, but if I do this, you can see it. The presentation that I made last week was to a startup company and I work with numerous startup companies. It's not the cost of quality as a percentage of sales, it's the cost of quality as the percentage of the burn rate, right? In a startup company, you have a burn rate because you have investors and they want to return on their investment as fast as possible and you're wasting their money when you make errors and don't do things in an efficient manner. It's again, it's about the context of the organization and about getting that message over. The message does not go over by stopping someone in the corridor and saying they're using expired re reagents for their experiments. It doesn't get over like that. It has to be a, um, you know, a, a message which shows money. Look, because, you know, and over the years, we've, we're a bit out of time, so I'm going to stop now. But over the years, I've had incidents where, you know, immediately, Immediately, the moment the companies start looking at it, they see that there's a huge amount of waste going on. Absolutely. That's what we, that's what we really want to pre prevent. Um, okay. If people have shortish questions, I'm quite happy for them to send them by email. I'll maybe, um, I would like anyway, uh, Uday, to update the present presentation. Um, I'm going to remove the slides that were behind at the end as backup slides because they have some personal pictures and I'd rather they don't go up uh, on the site. Um, and the PDF then can be shared and I will put my website and also my email on so it. You, yeah, and you can just can put your email. Yeah, people you, can send can me just... short, they can Sorry. send me short um, questions. If they're long, I won't get to them. I just don't have the time, unfortunately. But short questions, I'm happy to try and answer. It's a subject yeah. that I love, so I'm more than happy to try and do that. 
So you can just put your email ID here on the screen. Yep. Oh, uh, right. yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So that people can see. Yeah. And yeah. then they can, you can yeah. send it to Karen at PCI Pharma.com. There we are. And uh, oh, that went to organizing panelists only. You'll, you'll have to send it to oh, everyone. Uh, yeah, yeah. You'll have to send it to everyone. Yes, please. Okay. And if you want to go into my website, it's just PCI Pharma.com. So you can just go in there and take a look. But um, no obligation whatsoever. But thank you all very, very much for listening. And uh, I did enjoy it. And every time I do give talks, so I'm, I'm actually really working very, very hard to try and get ICHQ10 repealed. I don't doubt that I will have much success. And I did make a presentation also to PCA. So um, I, I don't think that it adds value. I think it's uh, confusing. And I'm, I'm very much in favor, as you understood, with the ISO. Absol yeah, absolutely. So, you know, before we say uh, goodbye to our delegates, I'll again tell you to, you know, have your final comments before we close the webinar. It was such an excellent session. Thank you so much. All the best. Thank you very much. And thank you all for listening. And thank you, Uday, for organizing it. All the best. Yeah. Thank you, delegates, for joining in today in such large numbers. We had more than 450 people oh, with goodness. about three, 350 <laughs> concurrent uh, viewers. Uh, Thank you for your trust in us, and please do join us next week for another interesting uh, webinar. Stay safe, stay at home, follow the directions of your government, and get vaccinated when your turn comes. Thank you, goodbye, and with this, we are closing our webinar. Thank you, Karina, and I'll send you all the information about this webinar.